for 4,000 years, but they still haven't given up all their secrets. If it weren't for one man, there wouldn't be any pyramids. In remote Egyptian deserts lie the very first pyramids he built. Exploring them reveals what a genius he was and how he overcame every disaster. Though unknown today, he was the greatest Egyptian who ever lived, the Pharaoh Sneferu. The ancient Egyptians never created anything as fantastic, as breathtaking, or as large as the Great Pyramid of Giza. Everybody's always amazed with the Great Pyramid. What impresses me most right now is the height. I'm about 40 stories up, and I still have a ways to go. Up until the time the Eiffel Tower was completed, it was the tallest building on Earth. What people don't realize is it's also a marvel of engineering precision. The base is 13 acres, but the sides are perfectly oriented on the four compass points. Before a building like this could be built, you had to solve immense engineering problems. The ancient Egyptian builders weren't perfect. There were failures, disasters, problems. And the man who solved the problems, the one who went beyond the disasters, was the pharaoh Sneferu. He's the one who showed Egypt how to build the pyramids. The pharaoh Sneferu was as well known in ancient Egypt as, say, Napoleon or Alexander the Great. But by a strange quirk of fate, He's almost unknown today. That's because it's his sons and grandsons' pyramids at Giza that are visited by every tourist in Egypt. Everyone knows these pyramids. What is far less known is that these pyramids are the final product of the Great Pyramid Building Age, the supreme effort of dedicated craftsmen who'd inherited their skills from the previous generation. The pyramids that Sneferu built stand unvisited and largely unknown. Almost as big as the famous Giza pyramids, these are what you could call the prototypes. This is where the art of pyramid building was perfected. But the pyramids say nothing about Sneferu the man. To see what he looked like, you have to go to the crowded Egyptian museum in Cairo. This is my favorite place in the museum. And there's never anybody here. But it's a wonderful bit of history. This is the first cartouche in the world. The magical oval that encircles the pharaoh's name. That's Sneferu's name in there. He's the first pharaoh that we have personal anecdotes for. He was a man, and we know something about him as a person. He lived 2,000 years before Aristotle or Plato. But he's not just a myth. He's a human being. We even know something about the way he looked. This is Sneferu on his throne here. But it's not an idealized portrait. It's not a pharaoh staring off into eternity. This is what the guy really looked like. He completed the greatest building project in the history of the world. Without Sneferu, we wouldn't have the pyramids. He was pharaoh,
but also a god on earth. And as a god, he needed a tomb that was the most magnificent creation the human mind could imagine. He needed a pyramid. It's amazing, but the six largest pyramids in Egypt were all built in a period of less than 100 years. A primarily agrarian culture, using only copper tools, cut, transported, and placed in precise positions, more than 10 million blocks of limestone, weighing an average of two tons each, to build the pyramids at Maidum, Dashur, and Giza. <laughs> Imagine moving a large block of stone into place every three minutes, day and night, continuously, for a hundred years. And this was all without using wheels, which would sink into desert sands. They were incredible buildings, perfectly aligned. No mortar was used. Not only were the pyramids massive, they were precise, accurate to a fraction of an inch. There are more than 70 pyramids in Egypt. The ones visited by millions of tourists each year are the successes. Unseen in remote Egyptian deserts are the failures, disasters that had to be abandoned. It was Sneferu who succeeded and built the first true pyramid. This unknown genius ruled at the beginning of Egyptian civilization. His pyramid was already 25 centuries old when Cleopatra showed it to Caesar. Sneferu was the first great Egyptian. In a sense, he was the George Washington of Egypt. Hollywood had it wrong. One of the great myths about Egypt is that the pyramids were built by slaves, forced to haul huge loads while being whipped by cruel pharaoh's overseers. In reality, they were built by free labor, which makes Sneferu's achievement even more incredible. Sneferu had to organize and pay thousands of workers for decades to build his pyramids. From a nation of farmers, hundreds of thousands of men were selected, divided into teams, coordinated, and dispatched to various work sites. But why did the world's first major building project happen in Egypt? Ancient Egypt was a very special place. Every year, melting snow from distant African mountains flowed north to the sea. The swelling Nile flooded the fields, stopping only when it reached the base of the pyramids. The inundation was a magical event for the Egyptians. The Nile, carrying rich topsoil from the south, first turned red. Then it turned green from the vegetation swept along by the water. Finally, it rose 30 feet. When the flood receded, it left the fields covered in rich, fertile river mud, perfect for planting crops. It was the Nile that enabled Sneferu to build the pyramids. It was the Nile and the Nile alone that turned the desert green. Without it, Egypt would be a barren desert. To channel the waters of the Nile to their fields, villagers joined together to create networks of irrigation canals. This was the world's first national works project. In the fertile Nile Valley, the first nation was born The Nile permitted Egypt to produce endless fields of crops. Flax, grains, vegetables, everything a society needed. It was here that the ability to cooperate on vast projects was born. All that was missing was a great leader. Now, Sneferu was the pharaoh 
who marshaled all the resources of Egypt. But he didn't do it by being a tyrant. He was viewed as kind. He was somebody we really would have liked. He was the first pharaoh with international aspirations. Any time an Egyptian set foot outside the borders of Egypt, it was a bold and dangerous venture. If you died in a foreign land, far from the priests, the embalmers, and the rituals, you couldn't be mummified. All hope for eternal life in the next world was lost. It was Sneferu who dared to defy custom. He sent his army on trading expeditions, north to Lebanon for tall cedar logs, east to Sinai for turquoise and minerals, and south to Nubia for gold. Under Sneferu, Egypt became an international force to be reckoned with. Sneferu was famous for his expeditions into the Sinai to mine turquoise. Such a venture required enormous organization. Taking 500 men and donkeys into the eastern desert required probably 30 boats for transport on the Red Sea and 50 tons of food a day. Once across the sea, there was a difficult five-day trek by donkey to the mines at Wadi Magara. Tunneling into the mountains in search of turquoise was dangerous. But an even greater danger was the hostile Bedouin tribes. Sneferu and his army made the Sinai safe for the miners. It's strange to see a boat carved on a mountain in the middle of a desert. But boats were an important part of the expedition, and the men wanted to record it all. This was a daring adventure they would talk about for the rest of their lives. They were crossing the Red Sea into foreign territory. There was a real chance they would never come back. It must have been much like our World War II veterans. And just like Kilroy, they left their mark wherever they went. On top of a mountain was a sacred cave where the miners slept to have dreams of where the turquoise would be found. Here the men built a shrine to the goddess Hathor, mistress of turquoise. Building the shrine took workers away from the mines, but the kindly Sneferu permitted it. He even sent skilled stone carvers so the men could record their expedition success, creating a field of engraved tablets. Today, this field still stands, pretty much as it did in ancient times. This one simply lists the names of the men on one expedition. But this one tells a story of suffering and heroism. The pharaoh's treasurer is recording the expedition he led. Because of the burning Sinai heat, winter was the mining season. But these hieroglyphs tell a different tale. Right here's the punchline. We arrived in this land the third month of the second season. These guys went in summer. He goes on. In the summer, the mountains branded our skin. These miners weren't slaves. They were willing to risk their lives to bring precious turquoise back for their pharaoh. The turquoise that the miners brought back from the Sinai was fashioned into butterfly inlays for finely crafted bracelets, gifts from Sneferu to his wife, Queen Heteferis. Sneferu wasn't just a pyramid builder and explorer. He was a patron of the arts. His royal workshops produced extraordinary masterpieces of sculpture, painting, jewelry, and furniture. It was an astonishing age. The artistic achievements during Sneferu's reign were so stunning that they set the standard for the next 2,500 years. 
the Maitun geese look as natural today as when they were painted 4,000 years ago. The statues of Sneferu's sons are the first great portraits in stone and have never been surpassed. The fine limestone portrait of Ankov shows him as a mature and thoughtful man. A bit heavy, he's successful. Ankov's brother, Hemienu, has rolls of fat. He's really prosperous. In the Cairo Museum is another of Sneferu's sons, Rahotep, and his beautiful wife, Nofrit. They sit side by side, their rock crystal eyes staring out at the thousands of visitors who stop to see them. There's a wonderful detail here. Egyptian women often wore wigs, and you can see Nofrit's own hair on her forehead peeking out from under her wig. The furniture that Sneferu had constructed for his wife is among the most beautiful ever made in ancient Egypt. They're masterpieces of simplicity. The lines are straight and clean and elegant. No need for a gaudy display of gold here. Merely beautiful gold hieroglyphs to proclaim the queen's titles. All of the queen's treasures, including her beautiful canopy bed, were placed in her tomb for her enjoyment in the next world. The ancient Egyptians were resurrectionists. They believed that the body would get up and go again in the next world. This is why the Egyptians practiced mummification, a complex religious ritual that took 70 days to preserve the body. It was absolutely crucial to protect the mummy from tomb robbers. If a robber entered the tomb and destroyed the mummy, then the deceased couldn't exist in the next world. Without an intact body, all hope of immortality was lost. And this was the worst catastrophe that could befall an ancient Egyptian. Once the mummy was preserved, an elaborate tomb was built to protect it for all eternity. These first tombs were called mastabas. These mastabas were carved into the bedrock beneath the sand. They would be covered over with a large superstructure made out of bricks. The ancient Egyptians called them the houses of eternity. This mastaba was one of the largest ever built. This is the burial of a very important person, probably a queen or a prince. This sarcophagus is the first one in history. The body was placed inside, the lid was slid shut, but still it was robbed. Here's the robber's mallet that they used to prop open the lid. After the burial, this chamber was roofed over, and in spite of the 100,000 tons of mud brick and stone that were placed on top, it was robbed. Sneferu had a big problem. His problem was that it was almost impossible to stop tomb robbers. Even in Sneferu's time, his own wife's tomb was robbed. No matter how complicated the passages inside the tomb, the robbers could find the treasure. The reason was that often the tomb robbers were the very men who built the tomb and knew it best. The answer to tomb robbing was to create something so massive that even if the robbers knew where the burial chamber was, they couldn't get to it. But Sneferu wasn't the first to try this. It all started at Saqqara. The step pyramid of Saqqara was completed during Sneferu's childhood, and it would have a profound effect on his life. The amazing thing about the step pyramid is that it's the first major stone building ever constructed. You would think 
that first there would be small stone buildings, and then larger and more ambitious ones, until something really grand was built. But it didn't happen that way. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, was the Step Pyramid. There are all kinds of signs that the Egyptians were just learning to work stone. The masons were merely copying columns and walls of existing palaces, built out of bundles of papyrus reeds and mud brick. Because they were faithfully copied in stone, wonderful architectural details were rendered completely non-functional. Doors that can't swing open or shut. Reed mats rolled up over doorways that can't be lowered. This is where building in stone began. 2,000 years after the Step Pyramid was built, the Greeks were proud to say that they learned how to build in stone from the Egyptians. The Step Pyramid was designed for Pharaoh Zasser. His architect wanted to create a grand burial for his king. So he designed a large mastaba and placed successively smaller ones on top of it, creating a wedding cake effect. Because this was the first large stone building in the world, the builders faced many new problems. They weren't yet skilled in working stone, so the blocks that made up the pyramid were only roughly cut and fitted unevenly, one on top of another, threatening the pyramid's collapse. The architect solved the problem by slanting the walls inward so the pyramid was literally leaning against itself preventing the unstable mass from collapsing. When the Step Pyramid was completed, it was the most fantastic construction the world had ever seen. Probably 10 times taller than any other building, taking thousands of workers nearly two decades to complete, it must have been the talk and pride of all Egypt. You can bet that when Snefru was a kid, he was fascinated by the pyramid, and maybe even dreamed of building his own. Now that you've seen Sneferu, King of the Pyramids, Part 1, talk about this. The documentary explains that the workers who built the pyramids were not slaves, but paid laborers who worked willingly for their pharaoh. Discuss how this theory differs from others you may have heard. What evidence does the documentary give to support this theory? Now try this. Research explanations of how the ancient Egyptians could have moved such large stones to build the pyramids, considering the limited technology of the time. Then, decide what theory you believe and debate your opinion with other students. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests Age of Pyramids, Egypt's Old Kingdom by David Roberts. Log on to discoveryschool.com for curriculum materials and resources to complement Sneferu, King of the Pyramids. Consider this before viewing Sneferu, King of the Pyramids, Part 2. What do you know about how the pyramids of Egypt were constructed? What advances in design had to be made before the Great Pyramid of Giza could be built? While watching the documentary, list the difficulties faced by Sneferu as he struggled to make a true pyramid and what he learned about architecture in the process. Assignment Discovery now presents Sneferu, King of the Pyramids, Part 2. the greatest Egyptian who ever lived, the Pharaoh Sneferu. The pyramids that Sneferu built 
stand unvisited and largely unknown. Almost as big as the famous Giza pyramids, these are what you could call the prototypes. This is where the art of pyramid building was perfected. Exploring them reveals what a genius he was and how he overcame every disaster. When Sneferu became pharaoh, he had a chance to build his own pyramid at my doom. As soon as you see it, something seems very wrong. But it's not clear exactly what. The monument appears more like an ominous tower than a pyramid. As you explore the site, more and more questions arise. Why are the walls of the burial chamber rough, unfinished? Where is the pharaoh's sarcophagus? In the burial chamber, the 4,000-year-old cedar beams lie in place, ready to lift the sarcophagus. But there's no trace of it, nor any evidence the burial chamber was ever used. It still represents a major architectural breakthrough. This is the first above-ground burial chamber in Egypt. Creating a room inside a pyramid, instead of under it, caused a tremendous problem. With the entire weight of the pyramid above, how do you keep the ceiling from collapsing? Snefru solved the problem by placing the stone blocks of the walls closer and closer to the center of the room as they went higher. As the walls were built up, the very top block forming the ceiling only spanned a few inches. The problem was solved, and the first corbelled ceiling in history was created. The answer to why the Maidum Pyramid looks so strange lies in its construction. It was originally intended to be a step pyramid. As it neared completion, it was expanded several times, probably because it was believed that a pyramid should not be finished before the pharaoh's death. When the pyramid was completed with eight steps, Snefru was still in good health. So the construction was continued. The steps of the pyramid were filled in with fine white limestone. This was the first attempt at a true pyramid, but there was a fatal architectural flaw. The final outer casing stones were not sufficiently anchored into the body of the pyramid. Because they rested on the smooth surface of the inner step pyramid, the stones began slipping, causing the first technological disaster in history. That's why the pyramid looks so strange today. Later generations found it easy to quarry the loose stones, leaving only the steep inner core. What we see today is a result of 5,000 years of vandalism. Sneferu had to abandon his pyramid. That's why in the little chapel at its base, the large stone tablets were never inscribed. That's why the burial chamber walls were left rough and unfinished. And that's why the ancient cedar beams were never used to lift the pharaoh's sarcophagus into its final resting place. In fact, the only way we know the pyramid belonged to the pharaoh Sneferu is because of graffiti written almost a thousand years after it was built. The scribe, Ankh Keper Senet, visited the pyramid and wrote on the chapel, I came to see the beautiful temple of King Sneferu. I found it as though heaven were within it and the sun shining in it. May heaven rain fresh myrrh. May it drip with incense on the roof of the temple of King Sneferu. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the architect, who was Sneferu's own son, to have to go to the pharaoh and tell him that the work of the last 20 years was in ruins? and that his tomb was unusable? It says a lot for the personality of Sneferu, that instead of raging and giving up, he simply ordered that the site of my doom be abandoned and a new location found. Still in need of a burial place, our man Sneferu proceeded full steam ahead to build a monument even more ambitious than the Maidun disaster. 
a pyramid more than twice the volume of the one abandoned, a monument that would far outshine anything the world had ever seen. Here, of course, the architects had the benefit of their experience. The Dashua Pyramid was designed from the beginning as a true pyramid. Learning from the earlier failure, the masons used much larger casing stones. This made it possible to properly tie them into the masonry of the pyramid. They also inclined the blocks inward toward the center of the pyramid. This technique was so successful that the pyramid is the only one with most of its outer casing stones still in place today. From the entrance, it's a very long way down into the body of the pyramid, more than 230 feet. One of the longest and most difficult descending passages of all the pyramids. The finely polished blocks of the wall are smooth, surprisingly cold to the touch. After bending over so long, it's a relief and a shock to enter a narrow room with a 41-foot corbelled ceiling. Incredible. We aren't even in one of the burial chambers yet. It's merely a vestibule almost as if Sneferu is saying, welcome. To get to the burial chamber, you have to climb up a swaying rope ladder. <laughs> then, the entrance to Sneferu's burial chamber is reached through a hole in the top of the wall. This is the reason for the massive ladder. After the rope ladder, this one seems very firm. When you're high on the ladder, it first hits you. All four walls are stepped inward to form a corbelled ceiling. It's incredible. Crawling through the narrow tunnel made by ancient tomb robbers, we finally hit the corridor through which Sneferu's mummy would have passed on the way to the burial chamber. Amazingly, there's a strong, constant breeze of fresh air here. Some investigators think there are hidden passages yet to be discovered. chamber. The great thing about Sneferu was he didn't give up after the Maidum disaster. He built this. When it was completed, it was the greatest room on the planet. It goes up 55 feet. Mohammed, I know I'm a fat 55 feet up, corbelled ceiling, the walls go in all the way up to the top. But there was a problem. The walls started to move under the tremendous weight of the pyramid above it. Down here are cedar beams, 4,000 years old. They had to be brought in when the walls started to move. There were problems here, too. The walls started to crack, move inward, and to make sure that the entire thing didn't collapse, they brought in the beams to hold it up. Originally, the Dashua Pyramid was intended to be a true pyramid. But when the problem of the burial chamber developed, Sneferu's architects decided to finish it by reducing the angle from 54 degrees to 43 degrees, which is why it's called the Bent Pyramid. This reduced the amount of stone needed to complete the pyramid and lessened the weight on the chambers inside. 
Despite this, the pyramid was still too dangerous for the burial of Sneferu's mummy. Sneferu had built the two largest buildings in the history of the world, and both were unusable. Amazingly, he didn't give up. But now, time was running out for the aging pharaoh. He had to build a successful pyramid for his final resting place. The bent pyramid must have inspired a sense of pride among the Egyptians. Instead of abandoning the site, as he had done at my doom, Sneferu built his last pyramid less than a mile away. Today, when the sun hits it, it appears red. All indications are that it was a total success. The burial chamber is stable, and it stands as the first true pyramid in history. There are signs that Sneferu had to economize a bit to make sure that the Red Pyramid would be ready for his burial. It's smaller than the Bent Pyramid, and its sides slope at a conservative 43 degrees. In the Red Pyramid, Sneferu finally solved his engineering problems. It's here that his mummy was laid to rest. From the disasters of the Maidum and Bent Pyramids, Sneferu and his workers learned the art of pyramid building. At Maidum, they learned the necessity of binding the outer casing blocks securely into the mass of the pyramid. A lesson they carried out so successfully at the Bent Pyramid that the outer casing stone is still in good condition today. At the Bent, they discovered how to create large internal spaces with the use of corbelled ceilings. And they also learn the problems this can cause. It's from Sneferu's pyramids that the ancient Egyptians developed the skills to cut, move, and fit large blocks of stone to build the pyramids of Maidun, Dashur, and eventually the greatest pyramids of all at Giza. Sneferu and his family were a tightly knit group who worked together and achieved remarkable results. Sneferu had at least five sons, and he made some of them the viziers of Egypt, keeping the power close to him, establishing a family trust that was to extend throughout his life. In addition to holding the post of vizier, several of Sneferu's sons became architects. The Sneferu brothers were really in the construction business. One of the most famous is Ankaf, the architect of the second largest pyramid on the Giza Plateau. Ankaf's brother, Hemienu, became vizier to another brother, the pharaoh Cheops, Hemienu was probably the architect of the Great Pyramid. Ra Nefer, one of the sons who didn't go into pyramid building, was only a high priest and general of the army. He was the family underachiever. This is an amazing family that produced amazing results. The effect of the brothers growing up with a father obsessed with pyramid building is clear. You can imagine the sons accompanying their father, first to view the progress of the Maidum Pyramid, then the Bent Pyramid, and finally the Red Pyramid. The passions of the father were truly passed to the sons. Sneferu's most famous son, by far, was Cheops, his successor, who is remembered today as the pharaoh who built the Great Pyramid, one of the seven wonders of the world. The Great Pyramid is really Sneferu's legacy to his son. This amazing monument couldn't have been built without the problems having been solved and lessons learned during Sneferu's incredible building career. If there's one trademark to be found in Sneferu's three pyramids, it's the corbelled ceiling. This ingenious solution to distributing the weight of the stone blocks above the burial chamber is what made it all possible. From the cautious start at my doom to the spectacular ceilings of the pyramids of Dashur, it was just a small step to its ultimate expression here in the Grand Gallery of the Great Pyramid of Cheops. One of the great interior spaces of all time, the corbelled roof 
runs for 153 feet and makes the gallery seem even higher than its actual 28 feet. In the burial chamber, Cheops outdid his father and hid from view his unique solution to the problem of protecting the roof from the incredible weight above it. The granite slabs that form the ceiling couldn't possibly support the pyramid above without some means of distributing the weight. To see Cheops' solution, you have to climb through a hole in the very top of the Grand Gallery. This is the secret to why the roof of the burial chamber didn't collapse. I'm directly above the burial chamber in a low room that was designed to take the pressure off the roof of the burial chamber beneath me. Above me are four other chambers, pretty much like this one. And on top of them, there are two huge slabs that form an inverted V, taking even more pressure off the burial chamber. It's a kind of corbelled roof that's been streamlined. Sneffer would have loved it. The relieving chambers worked beautifully. 5,000 years after they were built, the burial chamber is still intact, virtually undamaged. If it weren't for tomb robbers, Cheops' mummy would still be here. Not only did Sneferu pave the way for his son Cheops to build the greatest pyramid in the world, Sneferu's pursuit of foreign trade ultimately provided Cheops with one of the most important things he would take with him to the next world. In ancient Egypt, everything moved either by boat or by donkey. Donkeys for short hauls and boats for any great distance. In 1954, a boat was discovered, buried next to the Great Pyramid. It was 145 feet long and was built by Cheops from timbers brought back from Lebanon by his father, Sneferu. The boat was found dismantled, but the cedar planks were still strong enough for the boat to be reassembled. Some of the timbers are so large that there are no cedar trees left on Earth that could replicate them. Typical of ancient Egyptian boat design, the planks were tied together. When placed in the water, the wood would swell and the ropes would shrink, sealing the holes and keeping water out. The boat didn't have a mast and sails and only had oars to propel it. But what was the purpose of this boat? Was it used in real life by the pharaoh? Or was it intended for the pharaoh's last journey across the sky into the next world? To solve the mystery, I had a seven-foot model carved to the exact measurements of the pyramid boat for testing in a tank at the Webb Institute for Naval Architecture on Long Island. It's amazing how beautifully it glides through the water, leaving practically no wake. Drag plus one, three, nine, six, three. Because there was no sign of a mast or sails on the boat, at first I thought the oars provided the power. But computerized tests showed the boat's oars couldn't possibly have generated enough power to propel it. In fact, the oars seem to have functioned like a keel on a modern yacht to give the boat stability and direction. So how did the boat move, if not by oar or sail? This is uh, no hail, no yaw. Run 40. Okay, here we go. Okay. We know that ritual boats were often towed in ancient Egypt as they transported the body of the deceased from the east to the west bank for final burial. 
The 4,000-year-old cedar boat may well have brought the body of Snefru's son to the west for burial in the Great Pyramid. Exactly 70 days after he died, his mummy would have been taken up a causeway leading to his pyramid. Accompanied by priests chanting the ancient rituals, the body would have been laid to rest in the heart of the most astonishing monument humankind had ever created. The great era of pyramid building lasted only as long as Nefru's family ruled. His son built the Great Pyramid. His grandson, the second largest pyramid ever built, just next door. After that, the drive and energy to build such astonishing monuments faded, and later pyramids were just a pale shadow of their former glory. Ancient Egyptians looked back at the time of Snefru as their golden age. Seven hundred years after Snefru's death, the pharaohs of the 12th dynasty returned to Dashur to build their pyramids in the shadow of Snefru's monuments. The mud brick pyramid of Amenemet III, now eroded and crumbled, resembles an anthill in its broken state. They would never build a pyramid like this one again. When the Egyptians wanted to boast of something great, they would say, not since the time of Sneferu has its like been seen. Now that you've seen Sneferu, King of the Pyramids, Part 2, talk about this. One reason for building the pyramids was to secure a tomb where the pharaoh was to be buried. A major advance in pyramid building that made this possible was the corbelled ceiling. Discuss how it worked and its importance in building tombs beneath the huge stone pyramids. Now try this. Research the construction of the Mastabas before Sneferu's time and the Great Pyramids after Sneferu. Create a presentation on the architectural advances made before and after Sneferu's corbel ceiling. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests Pyramids by Michael O'Neill. Log on to discoveryschool.com for curriculum materials and resources to complement Sneferu, King of the Pyramids. The preceding program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a service of the cable television industry and your local cable company.